All right, so we're going to be talking about fluids uh, or properties of fluids. So first of all, we have to understand that when we talk about fluids, a lot of times we just think of liquids. But a fluid is not necessarily just a liquid, all right? Fluids can actually be things like a, a gas. Well, the first thing we want to talk about, the properties we're going to talk about is something called Archimedes' principle, right? This is dealing with something called buoyancy. And buoyancy is the ability of a fluid, a liquid or a gas, to exert an upward force on an object immersed in it. We have to also understand what exactly what a buoyant force is to completely understand Archimedes' principle. A buoyant force is a force that will determine if an object will sink or if it will float. All right, that's that upward force. So what does Archimedes' principle actually state? It says the buoyant force on an object in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Okay, let's unpack what does this mean? Okay, so if we take a look at a two by four, okay, we're gonna say that this black box is a two by four, okay? If I take a two by four and I put it out on a lake, all right, it's a very smooth lake, no waves, okay? Does it sit on the water so like 99% of it is above the water? No, no. Most of it is underneath. If I take a two by four, it sinks down so that it floats, but most of it is underneath the water. Well, let's take a look at what's going on. So as I take and put a two by four or this black box into the water, remember no two things can be in the same spot at the same time. For example, if I have a, a bucket of water and I take my hand and I put that hand into that bucket of water, the water and the hand cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So what happens is the height of that water start, will rise up a little bit, right? Because of the volume of my hand. Well, what's happening here is the same thing with Archimedes principle in the sense that when I put the black box into the water, the water and the wood, the black box there, cannot occupy the same spot at the same time. So some of that water gets pushed to the side. Okay, now the amount, the weight of the water that's being pushed to the side creates a buoyant force that's equal. This buoyant force pushes upwards. Now, if the amount of water displaced is equal to the weight of the object, the object will float. But if it is not, and let's say the object weighs 10 newtons here and only three newtons of water have been displaced, then the buoyant force isn't strong enough to hold up the wood or the black box, and then the, uh, the object will sink down farther into the water. As it sinks farther into the water, that means more water is getting pushed off to the side. As more water gets pushed off to the side, that means the buoyant force gets bigger. If the buoyant force is gets big enough, so that it's as great or greater than or the uh, weight of the object, the object will float. If not, the object will continue to sink. So example, we, we talked about wood thrown into a pond will begin to sink until the weight of the water displaced equals the block's weight. So depending upon the weight of the object, or the weight of the wood, that might be a little bit higher or lower depending upon how dense that, uh, that wood is. Now, <clears throat> let's say you take a steel block, okay, and you throw it into the water. Okay, the buoyant force acts on it, but the density of that block is too great, okay? And the buoyant force cannot overcome how dense it is, so the block begins to sink to the bottom. Now, I take that same block, okay, and I flatten it out, and I curve up the sides. I've basically created a very a makeshift boat, right? Now, as you put that boat into the water, it will begin to sink because the density of, of the steel is greater than that of water. But the volume of the boat displaces more water than that of the smaller block. So the buoyant forces 
are much greater causing this boat to float. And that's why you can have a huge, you know, like an aircraft carrier, which is, you know, hundred thousand, hundreds or tens of thousands, or even maybe even a hundred thousand uh, tons of steel and material float. But now if we take a look at an aircraft carrier, an aircraft carrier is, I believe it's like 10 stories high. But when you look at it in the water, most of that ship is below water. Like there's only like uh, three, three, it's only three stories high where like seven stories of it is below water because it sinks down and displaces more water causing it to float. All right, now, then there's Pascal's principle. Now, Pascal's principle says that the pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted unchanged throughout the fluid. So for example, say I have a brand new tube of toothpaste, right? I put it on the ground and I step on the very edge of it, right? And I slowly push down with my foot. What happens? It oozes out, right? Well, now if I take another brand new tube of toothpaste and I stomp on the tip of it on the very edge, what's going to happen? That toothpaste shoots out, right? Well, that's Pascal's principle, right? Pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted unchanged throughout the whole fluid. Um, this process was also used a lot in World War II when it came to depth charges, right? Basically, a depth charge was a barrel of explosives that would e explode at a certain depth in the water. And so a submarine would be cruising along and you would drop it off and you'd go down into the um, ocean and it would get deeper and deeper and then it would explode and submarines wouldn't, it, you know, wouldn't sink because of being hit by a, directly by a um, depth charge. It was the sub shaking up to pieces from the explosion underneath that water because that's being transmitted unchanged. That explosion is being tra uh, transmitted throughout the water. So let's first take a look at pressure. <clears throat> what is pressure? Pressure is a force exerted per unit area. Okay, now the SI unit is something called the Pascal. Okay, now depending upon your pressure that we talked about force exerted per unit area. So if I have a force, so we have a hammer here and it's striking the pin ball here or the uh, bowling pin, all right? It doesn't go in. Why? Because there's so much more surface area here that that energy is being dissipated through. Whereas I take a nail and I hit it with the same amount of force, it drives into the wood. Why? Because all that force from the hammer, if, if it's the same exact amount of force, is being exerted through a smaller unit of area. So there's more pressure on that single point, allowing it to drive into the wood. So <clears throat> we use this idea of pressure in things like a hydraulic lift. Now, there's some math to go through it, but I'm not going to go through that math now. But basically, what you need to understand is, is that you can have a large force, all right, at a slow speed, okay, and can cause a higher speed with much less force. Or you can put it the other way around. You could have a small force creating a large force later things like hydraulic brakes on semis and trains or a hydraulic lift in a car, auto shop, all right? A small amount of fluid can, with a small amount of force, can cause a larger force lifting up a large car later. Then we talk about Bernoulli's principle. Now, Bernoulli's principle states that as the velocity of a fluid increases, the pressure caused by that fluid decreases. Okay, so let's take a look at this plane wing here, right? This cross section of a plane wing, okay? So I have two particles right here, one right here and one right here. You gotta think of the wing as like kind of cutting through the air and that these two particles start and end 
in the same place at the same time? Well, the particle below, it has a straight path to follow, right? But the particle above the wing has a lot farther to go to go because it has a, a curved path. So if they start and end at the same spot at the same time, that means the particle above on the top of the wing has to travel faster. And if it travels faster, that means the amount of pressure, the amount of air pressure above he, on the top of the wing is less. So the pressure below the wing, if there's a push of pressure up on the bottom of the wing causing that plane to lift up. That's why a jet doesn't just instantly fly, right? It has to pick up speed. You have to get going pretty fast in order for you to get enough speed to cause enough pressure underneath to lift that plane up to cause it to fly. Bernoulli's principle is also used in other things like if you play baseball or softball, a curve ball, all right? Um, that curved path is because of a change in high of high pressure and low pressure because of the spin of that ball. Now that we have the Venturi effect. Now the Venturi effect talks about how fluids will flow faster when forced into a, to flow through narrow spaces. This causes the pressure to drop. So things like, um, If you take a look at how it says, oh, ooh. so for example, you take a look at a, a, a hose, right? You're having a water hose and what happens? The water kind of comes out of the hose, you know, nice and easy. If I take my thumb and I put it over the edge, the tip of that hose and cover some of that hose up, allowing a smaller space, a narrow space for that flu uh, water to flow through, what happens to it? It shoots out faster, right? Causing it to kind of shoot out at your little brother or sister. Yeah, so that's an example of Venturi effect. Now, viscosity. Now, viscosity deals with, with the resistance of a fluid to flow. Okay. So <clears throat> how fast something will flow. That's viscosity. Now, the lower the viscosity, the faster it will flow. So high viscosity equals slow low viscosity equals fast all right so maple syrup has a very has a higher viscosity than say tap water all right and with that uh this concludes our properties of